Again, my name is Heather Gray, and the program is Just Peace, and you are listening to WRFG Atlanta 89.3 FM. So I'm pleased to tell you and honored that we're going to be talking with Dr. Julius Garvey, who is the son of Marcus Garvey, the renowned Marcus Garvey. Uh, I want to give a little bit of information about Dr. Garvey. He is a board-certified cardiothoracic and vascular surgeon who practices in New York. He is affiliated with Northwell Health System and is clinical associate professor of surgery at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He has been on several educational and medical missions to Ghana, Senegal, Uganda, Mali, Sierra Leone, Jamaica, Haiti, South Sudan, and Ethiopia. Dr. Garvey has been internationally schooled in England, Canada, Jamaica, and the United States. He lectures on the life and legacy of his father, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah, Mosiah Garvey. Recently, he delivered the 10th annual Robert Sabukwe Lecture at Fort Hari University at, East, at the Eastern Cape in South Africa. It was jointly sponsored by this, uh, the Steve Biko Foundation. He attended the opening ceremony of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, which includes an exhibit and life on the life and legacy of his father, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And so, welcome, Dr. Garvey. <laughs> That's quite an introduction. Thank That's you. a mouthful, right? I thought I'd give it all because, you know, your history is so remarkable and all the work that you've been doing. And I must tell you, here at our station, at WRFG, we, you know, we talk a lot about what's hap happening, certainly in the civil rights movement, but also in Haiti and Africa, you name it. And we have every conceivable expression from the African diaspora. Uh, Dr. Garvey, I want you Wonderful. to know here at WRFG. Yeah. Good. Which is really good, right? So, mm -hmm. now I know that... That's our uh, diaspora, you know, we're scattered all over. I know, I know it's true. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, now, I received a notice this morning, and I'm just honored to, to immediately be able to talk with you about this. I know that you are in the process of attempting to get a presidential pardon for your father. So this is something that you're attempting to do through the Obama administration, I know. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, what you're attempting um, to do? Go you know, ahead. We've sort of um, been trying to get an exoneration from my dad, who was you know, wrongfully uh, uh, charged and wrongfully convicted back in 1923 uh, by J. Edgar Hoover and the Bureau of Investigation at that time. He ended up uh, spending, you know, two and a half uh, years in jail in Atlanta and then being deported from the country. And this uh, really, um, uh, in 1927, this really slowed down uh, the momentum of his movement, which was in the United States, the civil rights movement, and around the world, it was an anti-colonial movement. So, you know, we've been at this since at least 1987, where we have, we have worked with um, Congressman John Conyers, the House Judiciary Committee, Later on, with Congressman uh, Charles Rangel, who had uh, many different resolutions before the House uh, to try to get uh, a resolution passed to exonerate him. So now we're sort of down to the wire with our first black president, um, President Barack Obama, and the only legal way that we can get an exoneration, if you will, is through a posthumous uh, uh, presidential pardon, because there's no such thing as a posthumous exoneration. So we're trying, trying to use this process um, where we have placed uh, the forum uh, through a, a law firm that has done um, a lot of work for us for Bono, the Aiken Gump Law Firm um, uh, in Washington, D.C., have prepared a whole brief, you know, relative to the trial and um, the fact that, that it, it was a, a farce in terms of judicial propriety. Um, um, you know, there was no evidence. It was an empty envelope. Um, there was judicial misconduct by, by the judge, uh, as well as the prosecuting um, a, a attorney who, who, who coached um, the main witness to lie, and, and this was brought up, but there was no, no, no punishment, and there should have been a mistrial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they put all this together in, in a petition that is now on President Obama's desk, and they're hoping that he'll pay attention to this before he demits office. Could you, could you tell us... Dr. Garvey, why why is it you want to get this from Obama? What is what is well, the you know Marcus Garvey was um, you know I would say possibly our first polymath uh, in terms of he was a genius and um, he was the, the the most outstanding Pan Africanist uh, human rights act, black activist 
um, and the first half of the 20th century at least. And he's, he's um, idolized in many, many countries. And um, he, he's the, Jamaica's first national hero. Um, but his flag, the red, black, and green, which is the flag of, of liberation for African people, is part of the flag of many African countries. Um, he was the, the forerunner, if you will, of people such as Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, in this country. And, and people, you know, uh, 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 such as uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, Sam Nijomo, and, and Nelson Mandela. I just had a meeting with Nelson Mandela's grandson, the Dabo. And he was telling me how his grandfather always talked about Marcus Garvey and, you know, what an inspiration he was to him. And certainly I know that that was true in terms of the birth of the ANC in South Africa with the African National uh, uh, Congress. A lot of the Garveyites out of the UNIA went into to the ANC and formed it um, in its beginning stages. So he's an he's a international hero of major proportions. And he's honored all around the world, except in the United States, where he's considered a criminal. So if, hypothetically, and hopefully this happens, if the, if the president does this, then you're saying that his status will be changed in the United States and people will more easily be able to learn about him? Or is that what you're thinking? Um, well, not so much his status, but a stain will be, will be removed. And yes, As a matter yes. of fact. It's not only for Marcus Garvey per se, but it's the American um, justice system. I mean, it's an injustice when somebody is, is, is convicted in a biased uh, um, uh, situation. Um, um, the whole uh, trial, as I mentioned, was a farce. It was a, a, a judicial um, misconduct. Therefore, it is a stain against the American judiciary. So the stain is not only against Marcus Garvey, it's, it's against American justice. That's and a I really think that good needs point. To be rectified on both sides. Yeah, you know, we're all about social justice. That's what's going on in the streets now. That's exactly. Why Black Lives Matter. It's about social justice, and we have not had social justice. And this is a prime example. Well, let me bring up something. I I sent out, you know, the information about doing this interview with you, and mm -hmm. uh, so I received something back from um, some folks. What they were saying. Uh, free the Honorable Marcus Garvey. I will never participate in any action that imply America had had ever such ever been in control. Okay, of such strong Garvey intellect. So they they feel that getting something from the American government is is not something that they are interested in. So <laughs> your response to that? Your response? To well, that. I I think that in in some sense, um, um, uh, you know, um, how should I put it? Um, not really seeing the big picture, right? Um, you know, if somebody is criminalized by so the so-called the, the strongest uh, uh, country uh, in the world, it sends a message, uh, you know, out. Uh, it's the same uh, thing. If if black people are being shot down uh, in the streets, and our black men are being shot down in the streets, it says something about black lives to the world because this goes around the world. I mean, we're we're in an era where information goes around the world, you know, in, in a nanosecond. So to have somebody who, whenever his name is brought up, um, there's always this ring, oh, but in the United States, um, you know, he's considered a criminal, or, or he was criminalized in the United States by J. Edgar Hoover, and he spent two and a half years uh, in jail. That detracts from the understanding of who Marcus Garvey was, and this needs to be rectified. Um, you know, um, you know, somebody, you know, um, like Mahatma Gandhi, who had, who had been in jail. I mean, um, you know, his, well, of course, this, this was, uh, in India in terms of the major, majority of the population. They rectified any of these uh, charges that were brought against them, you know, by the British government. They had the ability to do, do that because they were the majority. Here, you know, black people don't have the ability to do that single handedly. We need the acquiescence, if you will, of the majority of the, of the population. So, you know, we see this as, as a way for all Americans to say that, you know, we are interested in social justice, whether it's for white people who are not achieving justice in the society or black people who are not achieving justice in the society. Mm -hmm. You know, just thinking about... Uh Mahatma Gandhi, he wisely at one point, well, he was asked by someone, well, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, well, <laughs> I think it's a good idea. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. I, I think Cliff has a question. Go ahead, Cliff. Yeah, you know, um, 
and thank you for joining us. You know, you've mentioned J. Edgar Hoover, and I think it's really important, you know, that folks recognize that, uh, you know, when we talk about how J. Edgar Hoover did this, this wasn't the J. Edgar Hoover that, you know, of the, of the 60s and, you know, the director of the FBI. This was a relatively young Hoover. Like, in many ways, he kind of came up off of, off, you know, off of your father and off of off of this case this is one of the ways that he kind of you know got big then and so that's a you know and, and that's an important thing because it then sets the tone for what would later become you know a series and a, and a trend of the FBI and, and, and federal law enforcement being used to squash political dissent particularly political dissent around civil rights you know the, what he did with your with your father eventually becomes COINTELPRO of the, of the 60s and 70s, which, you know, we still have people sitting in, in, in prisons off of what was done. And so this case and in, 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 in the work that your father was doing, that Marcus Garvey was doing, really set a trend um, in so many ways. You know, it's, it set a trend for the positive in the sense of the, the ideology and the lessons and the work that he did, which is carried on today. But it set this very dangerous, not him, but, you know, this experience set this very dangerous trend of, of of Hoover and FBI and COINTELPRO, so I'm just wondering, you know, what thoughts you have about about that part of the legacy, of about that part of how you know the FBI has been used over the years to do to you know hundreds and thousands of other people the same thing that they did to Marcus Garvey. Well, and you know, you're 100 percent right on that. This was a young ex Hoover just out of of law school and who was trying to make a name for himself. As a matter of fact, at that time, it was the Bureau of Investigation. I had not grown up to be the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And out of that case against Marcus Garvey, he made his name and became head of the FBI. And as you say, his tactics that he used were incorporated uh, then into COINTELPRO, which is the counterintelligence. The first black FBI agent was used against Marcus Garvey in the UNIA. So, you know, he got his start on Marcus Garvey. And, of course, as you mentioned, you know, there, there are literally thousands and thousands of people who have been scapegoated by J. Edgar Hoover. We all know about the Red Scare and so on. You know, how many people who were um, not communists but who were, whose careers were ruined, etc., with that kind of uh, witch hunt that J. Edgar Hoover was known to, uh, to produce. And he became very, very powerful, having all kinds of insider information against many f- powerful uh, people, including, you know, Martin Luther King, which he threatened to use against Martin Luther King. But, of course, Martin Luther King was not deterred, but they ended up getting him in another way, which was somebody shot him. Um, you know, somebody shot at Marcus Garvey, too, didn't get him, but that person ended up in jail but committed suicide within 24 hours, which is rather strange. But they were able to get Marcus Garvey out of the country be- because he, he was a, 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 an immigrant. So the the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover is is nefarious in its activities. The role of J. Edgar Hoover, I was just thinking, by contrast to your father, Dr. Garvey, you know, it just there needs to be more of I think of a better understanding and maligning of the work that the FBI has done. And also, as far as the legacy is concerned, and Cliff was talking about people being in jail, the FBI and uh, the CIA bringing in drugs into the community and so forth, which has mm-hmm. had its lasting impact here in the United States. So we have a lot that we need to look at. But I, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned. Again, my name is Heather Gray, and the program is Just Peace, and I want to tell you we're honored this evening to be talking with Dr. Julius Garvey, who is the son of Marcus Garvey, and he is uh, right now working on attempting to get a presidential pardon for his uh, late father, Marcus Garvey. Could you tell us just briefly, Dr. Garvey, about your, it's hard to be brief, I understand, but but about your father's work, what he was attempting to do. Would you, for those who might not know, would you explain a little bit about that? (laughs) It's hard to do, I know. You can't do it in a short (laughs) few statements, but just an overview. Well, it was about, you know, self-reliance and self-development in both the black community. And he was about African unity worldwide. One of his slogans was Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. And what he believed in was there was the unity of African people wherever we were. And at that time, we were only 400 million um, uh, African people in the world. 
Today we are 1.2 billion African people in the world. So we are the, the third, you know, largest uh, ethnic group in the world. And if we unite, then there's nothing really that we, we cannot do. So he was about our unity and our interacting together, whether we were in, the, in, in Africa, the motherland, or in the Caribbean, uh, or in the Americas. And this was one, one of the um, reasons why he developed the, uh, the Steamship Line, the Black Star Line, to unite us as a people um, through being able to, to trade and, and move um, between uh, that triangular area, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Americas. And, um, you know, that was why J. Gohova got at him, because he saw how powerful that would be if we were able to link up with each other you know, um, and have a reverse triangular trade, which was the opposite of the, the slave trade, and using this then to build ourselves in terms of um, acquiring the resources that were present in Africa, manufacturing goods and so on in the Americas, and then uh, trading amongst uh, ourselves. So, you know, this would be a very, very powerful socioeconomic uh, group. So that's why uh, he was targeted, and there was an attempt to destroy him and the movement. So let me just ask you also just quickly one question about mm -hmm. if people want to learn more about him, could you recommend mm -hmm. some books? I know there's the book Race First by Tony Martin. I don't know what you think about the book, but and then there uh, are there, there are, are any number of books. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, there's um, um, Philosophy and Opinions of Marcus Garvey. There are three volumes. That's the direct source. Um, there, there are books by um, Rupert Lewis. Um, one of them is anti-colonial, Marcus Garvey, anti-colonial uh, champion. There are books by, by Tony Martin. There are books by Robert Hill, and, you know, on and on and on. So, so definitely the philosophy and opinions are um, uh, three volumes um, that can be gotten uh, quite easily. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, Cliff has a question. Cliff, go ahead. Yeah, a lot of times with such historic figures like Marcus Garvey, such iconic figures like a Malcolm X or a Dr. King, you know, um, mm -hmm. we, we, we lose track of the fact that, you know, these were also people. These were, were humans. <laughs> these were, you know, fathers, mothers. Is there anything about him just as a, as a, as a man, as a person, as a, as a father that you think it's in, important for us to know or that you, you know, reflect on and would like to share with us? Well, another book that you can read is Garvey and Garveyism um, by my mother. Um, and um, uh, a new volume uh, is out with a foreword by myself. But basically, you know, in terms of um, my, how should I put it, influences from my father, uh, one is intelligence, um, the fact that the whole world was, was his... Um, it was his range, and he did not confine himself to quotes uh, Jamaica or any particular physical location. He, his ideas ranged the, the whole gamut of ideas from education um, uh, through economics and, and culture um, and, and on and on, philosophy, religion. Um, he, he left such a legacy that um, I'm still um, pushing myself um, to understand, you know, um, a lot of what he said and what he did. So I, I think that many, many people, if they really read his works, the, um, his works will expand their minds and almost infinitely because then they can apply, you know, his ideas in the current circumstances and to help them in terms of their, how they get over in their own um, lives. And I'm glad you mentioned you mentioned your mom, Amy Jock Garvey, and I'm glad that you you, right. you mentioned her because a lot of times, you know, we lose track um, of you know powerful women that were associated with some of our most popular historic figures, and she she really did a lot to both b <laughs> before his, his she she was his right hand you right know, right from from, um, from from editing the woman's page in the Negro World uh, um, uh, newspaper. You know, that was in existence from 1919 to 1930. Mm -hmm. She ran that woman's page. So she was a, a feminist um, with, before feminism was popular, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And she not only did that, but she's the one that published the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. She collected his speeches uh, at a time when he was imprisoned in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she published them. And she something published again uh, out of her own expense of, you know, Garvey and Garvey's intent. Just kept his, his um, ideas alive.
has tutored, if you will, you know, many, many people who have come and sat, um, you know, at her feet, so to speak, to learn about the inside story of Marcus Garvey and the organization itself. People like such as Rupert Lewis, Tony Martin that I mentioned, Tony Sanchez and so on, many others, John Henry Clark, etc. So she's been a mentor for a large number of people in terms of their understanding of that period and the inner workings of the UNIA and my father's thoughts. Dr. Garvey, we also our time is just going so quickly. We want to ask you also what people could do to help with this process. What would you recommend? Well, basically, um, you know, we, we had a petition going to collect 100,000 signatures. We have now moved on to the stage where we want the public to, if you will, um, ask the president directly for this posthumous pardon. And they can do that, do that at POTUS, P-O-T-U-S, which is an acronym for President of the United States. They can also uh, do it, and I think they should do it at both places, at, at VJ44, which is Valerie Jarrett, who is his trusted advisor. So if people will do that directly uh, to the president and ask him for a posthumous pardon for Marcus Garvey. They can also follow us on, on our uh, website, uh, justiceforgarvey.org, which is um, up and available for current information and so on. Uh, justice, the number four, Garvey.org. They can follow us there. But please, please directly uh, ask the president of, for this posthumous pardon at POTUS and at VJ44. All right. Well, thank you. Do you have another question, Cliff? No, that's it. I just was really glad to be able to be here for this. Well, Dr. Garvey, I just want to thank you so much for sharing all this with us. And um, so I also want to tell you, I'm originally Canadian. I was pleased to, to read that you went to McGill University. <laughs> oh, really? You're Canadian? Yes. Uh, I'm originally nine Canadian. Years in Montreal, if you can believe, I survived nine winters. <laughs> nine Canadian winters. <laughs> well, so listen, thank you so much for sharing all this with us, and we look forward to getting updates on what's happening with this process. And also. And, and please spread the word. Absolutely, and get okay. you know learning more from you and discussions with you. So well, we, we will be happy to do that. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. Thank nice. you. Take care Bye. now. Thanks. All right, Cliff. Yeah, I mean that's powerful. I just hope that <laughs> I really do hope you know because like you said, and I don't know how much of it is just because of the quote unquote stain of the the conviction and how much is just the just the reality that in this country there's there's very little appetite for teaching about somebody like Marcus Garvey but you know we really need to spread the word about brother Marcus because because the things he was saying were just so powerful whether you take it from the the cultural nationalism the political nationalism, the pan-Africanism the economic self-determination you know which is a, a critical part of his his, his belief system. There's so much to him that we really need to go back and take a look <coughs> at. And I hope especially younger folks listening or older folks that just don't know a lot about him, take a look at a couple of books that he mentioned because there's, there's so much we need to learn from him. You know, I do have this book, uh, Race First by Tony Martin, mm -hmm. but it's about Marcus Garvey, of course, but I know that he was recommending as well. I've had other people tell me as well but there are a lot of Garvey's own writings mm -hmm. that are that should be looked at as well. So, all right. Again, I'm going to give my email address, which is heather at wrfg.org. Please send me an email if you want to keep updated on what's happening with this pardon process and or anything else that we're doing here at Just Peace and WRFG.